Well, hello again, SRC family. Um, please join me in just a quick word of prayer. I want to pray for our kids' church class, and I want to pray for us, because um, at any time when we come to God's word, as much as it's God's word and it is an amazing thing, if the Holy Spirit doesn't help us in this time and doesn't help our kids' church volunteers and our children, um, we can hear the word of God and it go in one ear and out the other. And we don't want that, right? We want to be. We want to meet God in this time through His Word and be changed by that. So, would you just join me in a, in a word of prayer for this time? Holy Spirit, we thank you that we know, as you have promised, you have come because Christ has sent you to be our helper. That you dwell within all who trust in Jesus. And you lead us into the knowledge of all things according to your word. And so, Lord, we ask that you would do that in our midst, that you would open our hearts to receive from you the grace and truth that you wish to offer us today, that we would receive it with humility, where we might be challenged or corrected by it, that we would receive it with joy, knowing that it is a good gift from your hand, and that you would work so that we don't just come to know more about you, God, because of this time, but that we come to know you more, that we experience you more deeply and love you more deeply because of what you do in our midst today. And I pray, uh, if there's anyone here that has yet to come to trust in you, Jesus, that they don't yet know you in that personal, relational way, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them through this time as you are Spoken of, I pray that you would be lifted up and they would see you in all your glory and come to trust and love you and find you to be their greatest treasure and savior. And I just pray for our, our kids church class. Thank you for our volunteers who serve so faithfully in that way. And thank you for the children you've blessed this church with. And we pray, God, that you would work in a miraculous way that only you can by your power to reveal yourself to our children. And we want nothing more than for them to come to trust you and love you and live for you in whatever way you know is best. And so we pray your blessing on that time and on our time here together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you ready to dive into God's word together? Folks? All right, good. Well, this is the fourth week in our series entitled Building on a Gospel Foundation, where we've been learning together how God teaches us to build our lives and build the life of this church on the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done through his life, his death on the cross and his resurrection, right? And we've been learning how Jesus teaches us this through Ephesians chapters 4 through 6 specifically. And today we're going to focus on Ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 through 24. So I encourage you to grab a Bible and, and turn there or a device with a Bible app. Or if you don't have a Bible of your own, you can always take one of the hardcover blue Bibles that are in a pew rack in front of you and turn to page 978. But as always, when we're studying God's Word, I encourage you to have it open in front of you um, just so you can make sure that I'm not making this stuff up as I'm teaching it, right? Now, for the next two weeks, to give you a little bit of a, a preview, we're going to be talking about the gospel's new life. Basically how the, the good news of Jesus Christ, who Jesus is and what he's done, leads us to an entirely new way of thinking and living. And so today our passage is going to show us in general how we receive this new life and how it's meant to impact the way we think and live in general. And then next week, our, our following passage, starting in verse 25 of chapter 4 and on, is going to help us get into some more specifics. So if after this time you're like, man, I, I wish there were, Jake had been more specific, hold up, come back next week, and I promise you we'll get there, okay? But keep that in mind. We're learning about the gospel's new life. And so as I read this, follow along with me in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. It says this, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. 
assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. Now, it's important for us to remember the the context of this. So this was a, a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit, by God, written by the Apostle Paul to the original audience was the church of Ephesus in the first century. And it's important for us to recognize that the church of Ephesus was really a church primarily made of brand new believers. Believers who had just been converted to Christianity from their Roman lifestyles. And so they spent most of their lives worshiping the Roman gods and following the the lifestyles, which were rather uh, similar to ours today, a, a morally corrupt culture. And all of a sudden they become Christians and things have changed. And so Paul is wants to remind them that because they are now in Christ, there is a whole new way of living. And it starts with the way you think, and then how we think drives our actions. Now, the first thing you see right out of the gate, right, in verse 17, is he's calling them to get rid of their old lifestyles, to understand that you're no longer like the rest of the world anymore. When he says, you must no longer walk or live as the Gentiles do or those without Christ. And how they walked, in some cases, maybe just a week or a few years before. You're not that same person, so don't live that way anymore. Al Mohler, a a, a wonderful author and theologian, describes what's going on here by saying this. Paul reminds his readers not to be ruled by the person they once were but to become in practice who they already are in Christ. Now, it's possible that some may struggle to see or or understand the difference between life without Christ before and and life with Christ now. And so to get the point across, what Paul does uh, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit is show the contrast between life without Christ and life with Christ in this passage. And so this passage helps us to understand first what life is without Christ, is really like, if you get underneath the surface of it. It's really marked by three things. First of all, without Christ, according to verse 17, the way we think is futile. That's the word that's used there. Without Christ, we all naturally adopt a philosophy, a way of thinking about life that is futile, it's empty. It it leads us to live in a certain way and make certain promises. If you think this way and live this way, then this is what it will lead you to, but it never delivers on what it promises. It turns out to be empty in the end, futile. Now, for example, let's, let's contextualize it here for where we are today. Consider the pursuit of happiness. One of the unalienable rights of the Constitution, right? One of our highest values in our culture, the pursuit of happiness. And our cultural philosophy without Christ instructs us then to try and attain happiness by almost any means necessary through using people, wealth, power, fame, experiences, comforts, whatever you can get your hands on, use that as a means to the end of happiness. Pursue your happiness. Fight for it. Take it from somebody else if you have to. But get happiness and pursue it by any means necessary. That's essentially our cultural drive. But what our culture is teaching us to do is to live the lifestyle of an addict, for lack of a better term. To to spend our lives trying to find that little taste of happiness somewhere. And yet, even when we find it, even when we get that little satisfaction, it doesn't last long, does it? And so we're like, okay, well, we had that. Well, you try it again. It doesn't satisfy the same way, so maybe I have to try something else. And you start going through life trying to get that little taste of happiness, and yet happiness seems to always be slipping through our fingers and just out of reach, right? That's a futile thinking. And that's where all of us are, apart from Christ. That's the the philosophy that we all buy into if Jesus is not the one who's guiding the way we think. And that's just one example 
But while we, according to this mindset, are looking for what our souls long for in all the wrong places, we are actually missing out on the one thing and rather the one person who actually can give us what we're longing for. Which leads into the second point, according to verse 18. Without Christ, we miss out on the life of God. We are alienated, separated from true life that is found in God without Christ. In John 10.10, Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came to rescue us from many things. And one of the things that he came to rescue us from was from a futile way of thinking and living. He came to show us true life. To save us from the rat race of trying to constantly grab for whatever we can find that can't actually satisfy us in the end. He came that we might have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians 1.3 if you want to fact check me. That means fullness of joy in Christ. Fullness of peace. Fullness of hope. Fullness of love. Fullness of a sense of belonging. All in Jesus everything our soul needs and longs for, found in God through Jesus Christ. But without Christ, we have no clue that that's the case. We have no clue that that's even possible. And so we find ourselves alienated, separated from that true life, looking for what our souls need and long for in all the wrong places. And the combination of our futile thinking and our separation from God's life then leads us down an increasingly destructive path Verse 19 describes it, but if I could try and sum it up in one short phrase, it's this. Without Christ, the way we live is sinful. The longings of our souls for for love, for happiness, for joy, for hope, for purpose, they're relentless. And yet, thing after thing that we might try in this world, people, experiences, wealth, power, whatever, They don't satisfy us. And so that pushes us to try more and more things until we say, okay, well, well, if that first thing didn't work or it stopped having its effect, maybe I got to try something a little bit stronger. And so we we start down tiptoeing on this slippery slope that leads us into increasingly more morally compromised solutions to try and give us what we long for. And the scary thing is that over time, our hearts become calloused, as it says here. Meaning that once you kind of say, well, I have to do this, even though I know I probably shouldn't, but I have to do this in order for me to get this thing that I'm looking for, you become calloused in your heart, in your conscience. Where maybe you started, you, you began feeling like, ah, oh, this doesn't feel right, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. All of a sudden you're like, I don't care anymore. Your conscience becomes seared. You, your heart becomes calloused. You, you don't have a clear sense of right and wrong anymore because you've stopped listening to it for so long. So as a result, because of that dulled sense of conscience, our our whole sense of morality starts to become turned upside down. And it's immensely destructive for for us, for those around us, for society at large. Much of the the destruction and the, the upheaval that we are seeing in our world and in our culture today is because this is happening. You know, as it's expressed in, in Isaiah 5.20, God says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If you, if you take what God has set up and turn it over because you've stopped listening to it for so long, it doesn't end well. Or slightly more pointedly, Proverbs 14.12 says this, There is a way that seems right, to a man, to a person, but its end is the way to death. There's all sorts of things that we may lie to ourselves and say, oh, this just feels right, even though I know it might not be, but it feels right to me. It's my truth. And so we step into it thinking that it's going to give us what we want, but its end actually is death, destruction for us, for those around us, for our society at large. But I don't just want to be a Debbie Downer here because one of the things that I want to make clear that this passage makes clear is that's not the end of our stories. I know as I bring that up, as as we talk about that, for those of you who have trusted in Christ, that brings up memories, doesn't it? Man, I, I did used to think that way. That is how I used to live. 
And I don't know if you're like me, but the second that I start to think about that, about my past without Jesus, or, or even in the beginning stages of my walk with Jesus and the mistakes and sins that I still fell into, it's, my past is full of regrets. You know, I, I don't understand people who, who say, oh, if I could do it again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm like, I would do a lot of things differently. There's a lot of things that I wouldn't say, that I did say and hurt people. There's a lot of things that I did and I wouldn't have done if I had a chance to do it again. And here's where we need to remember and be encouraged by that. Christians, that's not the end of your story. That's not the end of my story. That's what verse 20 through 21 is leading us to understand. That, that once we have been taught Christ, once we learn Christ, everything changes. And, and it's important to understand here, it's not just learning Christ like, okay, Welcome to uh, Jesus 101, everyone. Welcome. We're glad. Hopefully you have your Jesus textbooks. And, and now we're going to learn about the historical facts about Jesus. That's not what it's talking about here. The knowledge of God, the knowledge of Jesus is, a, is an intimate knowing. That what we may know about him in our minds leads us to an experience of him in our hearts, in our spirits. It's knowing him relationally. You know, like I know you can pick your favorite celebrity that you've never met before and you know about them, but you know certain people. You know your family, you know your friends, you know your spouses, and so on. That's the kind of knowing that it's talking about here. When we know Jesus, it changes everything, and it changes our stories. So we come to know the person of Christ Jesus. We're brought into a relationship. And then the Apostle Paul leads the early Christians and us to remember that as Christians, there is a difference between who we were without Christ and who we are now with him. And so life with Christ is really summed up this way in verses 23 through 24. With Christ, our mindset and lives are renewed, is the word that's used in there. Renewed, made new. The moment we trust in Christ, Jesus works by the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out. We are made new, and yet he continually helps us to live in that new life, we need to be continually reminded that there is a new way we are meant and freed to think now. There is a new way we are set free to live now because we are in Christ. Because we all have a natural tendency to drift back to what's familiar. To act as if nothing's changed. Just because we have spent more time perhaps without Christ than with Christ, which isn't the case for everyone, but certainly in the initial stages of the Christian life, that's a common tendency. Now, before we dive deeper into that idea, the contrast between those two things and what it means for us more specifically, I just want to stop and pause here and point out to something that's being touched in this passage that I know is desperately needed to be heard by many people, and I know I need to constantly preach it to myself. So maybe if for no one else, I'm preaching this for me. Okay? With Christ... We are not who we were without Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17 is a, is a passage I constantly need to read and remind myself of, and maybe for some of you, you have to as well. It says, from now on, therefore, meaning because of what Christ has done for us and the fact that we are now in him and living for him in newness of life, it says we regard or think of no one according to the flesh. We don't define a person by who they were in the past, without Christ. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This completely clashes with a, a way of thinking about ourselves and others that is particularly being promoted right now in our culture. We have a, a cultural mindset that's being expressed in many ways where we think that everyone is defined by their greatest mistakes. Doesn't matter where you look on the, the social or political spectrum, you can call it cancel culture or whatever. Everybody, apart from Christ, is being led in a mindset where we believe that people are, can be labeled and condemned based on their past failures. So we find some dirt on somebody and we raise it up as if to say, this is who they are. And this is who they always will be. 
we live under the assumption that people can't change. That we are defined by our darkest moments. And I just want to clarify, that is the exact opposite of how Jesus has called us to love people. I mean, 1 Corinthians 13 says, love believes all things. It means gives the benefit of the doubt. Treats somebody as innocent until proven guilty without any doubt. Love hopes all things, hoping for the best rather than assuming the worst about a person. And love endures all things. Lovingly tolerates even when it causes discomfort in the time. Now that's just a side point here, but the main issue I want to address in the midst of this is the fact that many Christians apply that same condemning way of thinking to themselves. I struggle with that, and I know many of you probably do as well. You look back on, on your past with so many regrets. And even though you know, okay, I've confessed those things, and Jesus is faithful and just to forgive me of those sins and to cleanse me of our unrighteousness. But in the dark nights of your soul, there's a whisper. It brings up these little voices. It brings up these past memories and says to you, that's who you are. You, 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 Jesus couldn't possibly love you. You can't possibly be used to do anything good in this world because that's what you did. And so you sit and soak in these accusations that keep coming up in your life. I want to clarify one very specific thing here. That is the voice of Satan. One of Satan's nicknames in the Bible is the accuser for a reason. So when you hear that voice, which sounds like your own thoughts, and maybe in some cases it is, saying, that's who you are. That person apart from Christ, all those regrets, that's who you really are. It's a lie if you have trusted in Christ. And instead of listening to those voices, we need to preach a very different message. The message of texts like Ephesians 4, 17 through 24 and 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17. Like I, I know uh, like, I have to do this on a regular basis where those, those nights, those insecurities, those regrets come up and I need to preach to myself, I am not who I was. I am a new creation. The old me, that old way of thinking, that old way of living, I do not have to be that guy anymore. I am a new creation and a new me has come. Yes, is it a challenge to walk in that? Yes, but nonetheless, I am not defined by my greatest failures and my darkest moments. That is the truth. Jesus doesn't just make us a slightly improved version of ourselves. He doesn't just come alongside the, the vehicle of our lives and slap a Jesus fish bumper sticker on the side of it. He guts it. He guts our lives and says, you're not just a, a slightly polished up version of your old self. You are an entirely new creation. And there's tremendous liberty in that. The moment you trust in Christ and the moment that you confess to Christ your sins, you have a clean slate. And it's so sad that in many cases amongst professing Christians, we, we totally lose that in the way that we look at others or the way that we look at ourselves. And so as much as that's not a, a primary point of this text, because this text touch on, touches on it, I just want to go there for a moment. Because I know that there's some of you probably here who are in bondage to that condemning voice and you need to be set free by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, as we go through life, what we're doing now, the Christian life in essence, is seeking to walk or live according to who we are in Christ now. We have already been made a new creation. Now live like it is essentially the essence of this passage. And so what do we do in a general sense? Well, in light of the contrast between life without Christ and life with Christ for all those who are made new in Jesus, there are two primary actions we're, we're given in this text. And I'll present them both together because they really are inseparable in many ways. They have to be in tandem. So in light of all of this, therefore, we must take off the old self, verse 22, 
and put on the new self. That's the beginning of verse 24. If we have trusted in Jesus Christ, he has freed us from our old self and given us a new self. Our old self without Christ has been crucified with Christ, meaning that person that you and I were before Jesus is dead. He can't be brought up in a court of law. I can't be defined by that person because he's dead in Christ. He's gone. Now, I may try to resurrect him in my foolishness, and maybe you try to re resurrect your old self. But the bottom line, he's dead. And he needs to stay dead. And part of what we do in that process is laying aside that old self. Laying aside that old way of thinking, that old way of living. When we find ourselves drifting back into the, quote, good old days that are really the dark days, we need to then say, hold on a second, that's not who I am anymore. That's not how I have to live anymore. I have a new life. I have a new identity. I have a new purpose. And we need to put on the new. And that's an ongoing process, moment by moment, situation by situation. Like getting dressed for the day. You know, I don't know about you, maybe, maybe it's just me, but you ever just had a, a really long day and you just go and you just collapse into your bed and you're wearing your day clothes when you fall asleep? Right. And so you wake up the next day and you're wearing yesterday's clothes. But it's a new day. So how do you get ready for that new day? You take off yesterday's clothes and you put on the new clothes of today. That's what we need to do as Christians every day. And sometimes in, in situations, it's, it maybe you, you woke up and you put on, you took off the old self, had nagging voices that you're like, I don't have to listen to that anymore. And you put on the new self, but then you step into your workplace, you step into your office, you step in wherever, and all of a sudden there's a new situation and you find, wait a minute, where did that old self come from? You take it off again. You put the new self on again. Just ongoing, continuing maintenance of this new self. And that's how it is with our lives in Christ. Every day, every situation, checking ourselves, being like, hold on a second. Am I thinking according to the new me? or am I thinking according to the old me that just doesn't want to let go? Wherever the old me is coming and creeping back, I need to take that off, and I need to put on the new me again and again and again. Now, to try to give a, a little bit more personal touch to this, let me just lay out some examples that at least I know are true for me and, and for people that I've spoken with in my time in ministry and as a Christian, but you will probably have to fill in some blanks for yourself in this. And, and next week, we will certainly fill in some more blanks. But our old self, first of all, is a way of thinking. A way of thinking like, who I am is what I do. I'm defined by what I've done. Or, or what's been done to me. My identity is my failures, my successes, my occupation, or my trauma. That's who I am. Or, or the old self might say, well, my value is the sum of my successes and failures. Or my worth is based on what other people think of me. Or, or I can only be happy if I have all the right circumstances and things in this world. That's the old self in a few expressions. And whatever those kinds of voices creep up, we need to take those off and say, no. That is not who I am anymore. That is not how I have to think. That is not how I have to live. I don't have to keep living in insanity, trying the same old things with different packaging and getting the same result. I don't have to keep looking to things in the world and people in the world and saying, maybe you can make me happy. Maybe you can give me peace. Maybe you can give me hope or a sense of purpose. And then they fail us. And then you say, well, maybe i got to just try a new one. i got to get a new boyfriend or a girlfriend. Or maybe I've got to get a new relationship. i got to get a new car. i got to get a new job. We're set free from the futility of that. 
And we have to remind ourselves of that. We don't have to get stuck in the same rut that the rest of the world is in. And that leads us to a new way of thinking and a new way of thinking, or a new way of living. And so in every way where those voices come up and say, that's who you are, this is how you need to think about life, we take that off and then put on things like this. Who I am is not based on what I've done or what's been done to me or what I'm doing right in this moment. But who I am is ultimately defined by who Jesus is and what he has done through his life, his death, and his resurrection for me. My worth is not in what I own or what I accomplish or my occupation. My value in this life is not what other people think of me, but what Christ alone thinks of me. And every blessing, every rich, every glorious inheritance that God has given me as a child of His, that is who I am. That is how I think. And I know now, the new mindset is, no matter what I might lose in this life, you could take everything that I have in this world, take my wealth, take my house, take my family, but as long as I have Jesus, I have everything I need and long for to be satisfied fully and completely. That's the new self. Those are the kinds of things that we need to continually remind ourselves of. But it may just feel like a normal Sunday or tomorrow a normal Monday. Like maybe we've lived for many decades before. But the difference between a Monday without Christ and a Monday with Christ is an entirely different thing. We are transformed people. Not just a slightly polished up version of your old self. If you have trusted in Jesus, you are a new person. And with Jesus' help, we can live like that. Yes, we will stumble back into the old self. And that's why there is this call. He's speaking to Christians and he's telling them, listen, when you fall back into this and those old spiritual clothes get on you again, take them off. Put on the new self. And then there'll be another day where you stumble back into it and those old clothes come on, those old ways of thinking and living come back and you fall back into the, that addiction. You fall back into that terrible choice. You fall back into that futile way of thinking and living. And then he says, Jesus is like, you're not done. Hold on. Take it off. Put me on. Live in the new life that I've afforded to you. We are free to live lives that forsake sin, its destructive practices, and its futile thinking, and instead are empowered to live in a life that our passage at the end there describes as we being people who have been created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Wow. Now next week, we're going to dive into what that looks like more specifically in Ephesians 4, 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. For those of you who like to read ahead, there you go. But, but here's what I want to do for a, a few minutes here, okay? Because I know I, what I've just laid on you is an entirely, for some of you, an entirely new way of thinking about life, a new way of thinking about yourself. And it's jarring. So I want to give us some time to let it settle, to give you time to pray through it and process it. And I encourage you to do this, okay? Maybe for some of you, you need to pray and ask Jesus to help you identify the old self that keeps creeping back. Some of you don't know. So that's okay. There's grace for that, and Jesus can help you identify those things so you can take them off. Some of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know that old self that haunts you. And so now maybe what you need to do is pray and ask the Lord's help to take that off. And, what it, and to identify and remind you, who is that new self that Jesus now gives to you and you can put on? And, and I just want to say, for some of you here, like, well, this whole old self, new self, like, I, I'm still not sold on this whole Jesus thing. Like, I'm here and maybe I think you're interesting or maybe I'm, I don't think you're interesting at all, Jake, but I'm here and, and I don't have this old and new contrast. Well, then maybe a, a good use of this time is just to ask God, God, if this, this is true, 
then would you show me, like, how is my, how is my thinking futile? Sit and examine your life. How, have you th how has your way of thinking and living gotten you to this point? And are you satisfied with that? Has it given you what you thought you wanted? Has, has life, as you've lived it on your own terms, given you what it's promised? I'm not a prophet, but my guess is that the answer, if you're honest, is no. And the offer in Jesus Christ is that you can let that go and find true life and a new self in Jesus for free.